That's okay, just that, that was good enough. Okay. Um, I want to start with a few thoughts and comments that have come to me over the weekend and just hope and pray that Steve doesn't ring the bell on me. Uh, first of all, just to let you know that about a week ago, I uploaded to YouTube a videotape of Robert Rouse talking about Francis's life and work. And the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes of it are about the writing of State of God. And mm -hmm. if you just do a search on Robert's name or maybe my name, mm -hmm. you'll find it. If anyone doesn't have internet connection or a reasonably fast internet connection, I've got three DVDs here. I've just given a, a, a copy to Roy for archives. And there's three DVDs. If you don't have a good internet connection or don't have access to the internet, you're welcome to take it. You're welcome to duplicate it as many times as you like. So that's just ask me about that. Um, I've been really struck over these past um, two and a half days of just how much delightful overlap there is between people's presentations and how much I keep hearing the same words and concepts coming back in a really delightful and consolidating way. Um, and it's been, it's been delightful. And I was saying to Ward, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to start reading Stay With God all over again as a group. I thought it was a fantastic experience. I was struck by, this is not directly on my presentation, but just as a, as a preamble to it. I was struck by the role of teamwork in the production of, in the writing of Stay With God. I've, I've had, until this weekend, I've always thought of Stay With God as Francis's, what's, is it Magnus Opum or is that the ice cream? <laughs> Are you confusing me, Steve? It's a very large ice cream. <laughs> and I was, struck, I was struck by how much teamwork was in this, was in Stay With God. The, the great teamwork of Barber and Francis because mm -hmm. Francis was reading it to Barber, and Barber presumably was involved in the in, in that sense in the writing of it. I was I've been struck by the teamwork between Francis and Robert and Lorna in the writing of, of um, Stay with God. I was struck. I didn't know until a week ago that Joanna was involved in the research on the notes of Stay with God. Um, one thing I did know and I do remember clearly was sitting around in what we used to call the big room at Mayer House and it's now seems to be called the Barber Room. And we were all, children and adults, were working on the, the production of Stay With God. I, Bernard, I, I don't think you were there. Do you remember being there? There was... In there Sydney. Was, in Sydney? No. In, no, okay. I remember Robert, Bill, my mother, Lorna, I think Diana Snow, um, and other people, and also my sisters and I, and there was this <coughs> this great sense of of, of um, the enjoyment of a shared task. And I remember we would go through the galley proofs because I think printing and I don't know if it's still true, but printing of a book, the first stage is is what they call galley proofs, which is a sort of a continuous sheet, and they're quite wide of the, of the text, and you've got to go through and look for errors. So we would go through it reading it out aloud in a particular way and someone else would have the manuscript and and I remember um, intense discussions about the colour of the cover, the, the shade of the, the two, sh two shades of green I think it is and and just and I remember that this 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 delightful sense of teamwork and and I remember even as a child that my opinion as a opinion about the colour was listened to and it was, it was a, a lovely experience so I just, want, I just wanted to make that comment about the teamwork behind Stay With God. A number of people, the second thing I wanted to comment about was the, um, the, 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 num the, the comments that have been made about Francis's remarkable uh, knowledge of the spiritual literature and the myths and legends of the world. And Barber himself commented on that. And I think someone quoted Barber saying, Francis, how do you know all of these things? And I just want to make a couple of comments about that. One is, I think Francis himself wondered the same question. I remember him saying to me and maybe to other people that he felt guided in his readings. He wouldn't know why a book would fall off a bookshelf and hit him on the head or why a book would appear in the, in the mail or why a book would, he would open it. So he, he, I remember him conveying that, 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 he, that he seemed guided in his reading. I don't know if any, 
By the way, I, I would like this, my presentation to be more of a workshop than a presentation, so please at any time jump in with anecdotes. Mm -hmm. One of the things that there's a rich oral history that we have, um, in the, at the Springs of Harvest last year, I was presenting on the Baron, and some of the information that came out was so delightfully new and important. I remember Sam, Sam Saunders commenting from the back of the room here about um, uh, Francis's comment about the Baron's last days and, and his acceptance of Barber. So any pieces of oral tradition, please share, because I think that's really a delightful aspect of these sort of weekends. So I, I, just going back to Francis being guided in his reading, he certainly made that clear to me. Um, Don Stevens commented that next to Erich, uh, Francis had the greatest store of spiritual stories of anyone that he's known. A third, a third aspect of this I wanted to share that seems relevant in a, some sort of a subtle way was I was sitting one day on a park bench at, Mer at the Barber Centre in Myrtle Beach next to Darwin Shaw. And out of the blue, there was no particular context to it, he said to me, I feel that Francis had been Socrates. Mm -hmm. So that, that mm -hmm. may also give us a clue as to how, mm -hmm. how Francis knew as much as he knew. Mm -hmm. um, There's also the discussion that Francis was Beethoven. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Francis was Beethoven. <laughs> I heard he was <laughs> Enchanted evenings in this room, and, and after hearing Tian's presentation, I was rem remembering Francis telling me about perennial Chinese philosophy, and I remember, I remember him telling me some Chinese point of view about the universe as being on a wobbly axis, and I don't remember the point of it. I don't remember the, I don't remember the gist of it, the meaning of it, but I remember the intoxicating feeling, the intoxicated feeling that I had as Francis was sharing these um, sublime and, and perennial It was truths. one of the four classics that uh, of Confucian canon is called, is translated by the name of uh, Unwobbling Pivot. Ah, okay. There. Okay, that's, that mm -hmm. must have been what he was telling me about, yeah. The third thing, and it's interesting how many people, I think John used the metaphor, separating the wheat from the chaff, and, and at, at a personal level, when I think about my relationship with Stay With God, and, and particularly in, in my late teens and, er, and early adulthood, I remember feeling that Stay With God gave me an unfair advantage because it was such a fantastic guide to separate the wheat from the chaff. It was so, it was so authoritative and so definite and so clear about you know, what was worth pursuing and what wasn't worth pursuing. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that was certainly my own personal experience. And um, I was an ex extremely unmotivated um, high school student, and I much preferred to go surfing and then um, go to school. And, but, but I was very passionate about art and art history, and it was wonderful to study. Helen Gardner was the text that we used. I don't know if anyone knows it. But it was wonderful to study art history knowing this perspective, this insight, this wisdom that Francis had given us through Stay With God. It was sort of like a cheat sheet, if I can use that term. It's like, oh, okay, I could spend time on that, but actually Francis is nudging me this way. So that was a wonderful aspect of Stay With God. My presentation is not actually about, directly about Stay With God. It's about half a stanza in Stay With God, which Steve is going to read out to us in a moment. Um, and I'm thinking of this as of what I'm going to present and hopefully you'll participate in as really part of the nest I think that word came up on Friday part of the nest within which Stay With God exists and this nest is these, these three heralds to Barber's advent it magically took up full screen incredible 
God is great. God is great. <laughs> so, how did that happen? Did you do it? I uh, Jim. 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 Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Unseen, even. Unseen. <laughs> um, so this, this stanza occurs in Stay With God, Book 5, Part 3, and it's actually the one part we didn't read on Friday. Ward made a decision to save time. We would skip over this, just this one part. So the, this is the quote in the original font, and Steve, you're welcome to read it in that font, or you're welcome to read it in that font? Oh, this This first font. Thank you. In the meantime, back home in the house they had built, according to the plans and specifications laid down by their father, the natives were continuing their tribal ways of song and dance and instructing their children in the arts of seeing, understanding and memory, tempering the intellect of their youth so that it could not be affected by fire establishing in their breath the living word and the enthroning in their hearts the true God. Then the father chose three sons so trained and sent them to us with weapons of love to take up the war we had started. And their names were Vivekananda, Kumara Swami and Inayat Khan. And the sword of the first made music like the deep notes of a cello, and the second like a fugal violin, and the third the haunting tones of a primitive <coughs> flute. I told my barber story at the Myrtle Beach Centre um, two Easter's ago, and I opened it by with this quote because it gave me an opportunity to then talk about Inayat Khan, the Baron, and Francis and Baba coming to Australia. And someone from the front row, who can be named, because he comes out of the story looking fine, is Ira Shader. And he said, hold on a second, in an American accent, um, I heard Elizabeth say the three heralds to Baba's advent were, were Vivekananda, Inayat Khan, and Abdul Baha, who was the third of this third in succession of the Baha'i fame. And and I said to Ira, I mean he was not a, he was absolutely not aggressive about it, he just was sharing this. And I said, um, well, Ira, my understanding very clearly is this is Francis's opinion. That this, he isn't Francis is not saying that Baba said this. This is Francis's view that these three figures were heralds, three sons, to, um, to prepare the world for Baba's advent. And um, a few months later, by chance, I heard, I, I came across a, um, that's interesting, that I came across the very tape, a tape of the very talk that, that Ira was talking about. And um, he's, int sorry, Elizabeth Patterson is introducing Wood Dimple. And I thought that, um, and, and she does say exactly as Ira says. She doesn't, I don't believe she says Barbara says, but she says there were three wise men who, who heralded Barbara's advent and they were Vivekananda, Inayat Khan, and Abdul Baha. And I came across the tape just by chance. I was <coughs> looking for something entirely different and I came across it. And I don't know why it's not an active link. <laughs> uh, Ooh. Volume up, please.
I'm not telling you about him because we can also talk about him some other time. And then, uh, Ina Dayu, pronounce it for me. Inayat Khan. Inayat Khan. And Abdul Baha. And Baba has said of them that he was his, for, that his forerunners. They were his forerunners. <coughs> if it wasn't for them, people in America or the West in general wouldn't have been so prepared for his coming, prepared for what he said, prepared. And they were perhaps even icebreakers in this country because uh, people just didn't want to be. But then when they saw men of these, of these statues, not that they had anything to do with each other necessarily, but wise men and saints are some way connected with each other. And, and they came at different times, but they made such an impact that when Baba came, people had some knowledge of Eastern uh, religion, Eastern thought, Eastern ideas, which of course, I always want to say that there is no religion but an Eastern religion. Christianity is an Eastern religion. Jew Jewism uh, is an Eastern religion. Mohammedanism and so forth. I'm, so I'm sorry about that. There was another tape running in the background and I didn't want to risk undoing Jim's good work and try and find it. <laughs> Did everyone get the... Could you hear most of it? Yeah. 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 Great. But by the way, that tape, which I think you can find on... There's a website, um, mundalyhalltapes.org. And if you look for Lud Dimple, because because Elizabeth is introducing Lud Dimple, you'll find that tape so you can hear it. And Lud Dimple actually goes on partway through and tells a brief story about be playing and beating Francis at table tennis at Myrtle Beach in 1952. So uh, that might be that. It's, it's interesting from that point of view as well. I think I was at the talk. I think that's the talk that I heard. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, I just I remember it was the talking that. Oh, okay. Like that. Yeah. And the country being different from Francis. Ah, uh, yeah. It's a really her introduction is really a wonderful introduction because she essentially summarizes Sufism in a really clear and and very respectful way. It's really it's quite lovely. It's really worth worth, worth finding. So the so I'm gonna I'm going to do Francis's list. If this time I'm going to very briefly talk of, talk about. Um, Abdul Baha, but probably the bell will ring before then. Uh oh, he's reaching for it. <laughs> um, these are just a few images of you know, uh, that. What he's written, I guess it's in Bengali. Is one infinite, pure, and holy, beyond thought, beyond qualities. I bow down to thee. That's apparently what that script says on the on the left. <coughs> And that is, um, that is a photograph of Vivekananda at the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893. How many people heard, how many people heard Francis, how many, to who, to how many people did Francis tell the story of Vivekananda giving that speech? It, yeah, so a number of us have, have heard that. Bernard, yes? Yeah. And it's... And um, amazingly, to my great amazement, about uh, sometime in the last 10 years, I discovered there's actually an audio recording from 1893 of the very speech, <coughs> which we will play in a moment. Mm -hmm. Just one, one practical thing I want to mention was, in, in, the, dis in the historical accounts of, um, of this speech, which was really a very important speech, it made a profound influence on, on Francis and maybe... Maybe Sim and John and Peter can, can talk about how they remember Francis talking about it. Um, the, the, and, and we'll read it in State of God in a moment. Um, Vivekananda starts, Sisters and Brothers of America. And the audience rose to their feet and gave him a standing two-minute ovation. So in the recording, 
Someone, I think, has edited it. I mean, I'm assuming that it is a two-minute ovation because I've read that in different sources. But I think, unfortunately, someone has chosen to edit the, the ovation, the applause down. So we'll get to that. Um, so this is the quote. Steve, would you mind doing the, doing the needful again? So this is the quote from Stay With God where Francis talks about this event. English, a developed language, Milton, we are told, made it resonate. But why did he have to stand on his head to do it? <coughs> Milton, blind. And Homer, all seen. No one seems to have mentioned that resonance is a quality of the heart. When Vivekananda got up in Chicago and merely pronounced the word brothers, Half the assembly got up on their hind legs and cheered. Vivek knew that the blank paper script Vivek knew the blank paper scriptures by heart. In fact, his heart was painted with whiteness. His heart encompassed brotherhood. Brother was he in true sonship of his guru. So when the particular of this general light condition occurred on his tongue. And he said, brothers, <coughs> the resonance reverberated in the souls of the audience. And their soul remembered their natural posture of verticality. <laughs> and they stood up. <laughs> thank you, Steve. And thank you for doing it without preparation. Please forgive me. No. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have it. By the wonders of technology in 1893. Yeah. Thank you. 
human demons, human society would be far more advanced than it is now. But their time is come now. And I fervently hope that the bell that tolled this morning in honor of this convention may be the death knell of all fanaticism, of all persecutions with the sword or with the bell, and of all uncharitable feelings between persons wending their way to the same goal. I'm, thanks for that. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry that Francis never got to hear that. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Peter, Peter, would you like to share your well, memory of Francis talking about this moment? More, I'm a bit confused because I, I first heard of Peter from a book my mother brought back when I was 15 years old or something like that. So, um, I knew there were masters to life. That was one of my first knowledge of that. And I'm sure I read somewhere in that book that story. Mm. Um, the, the, uh, the most important part of the story, and I think part of this came from Francis, was that the other delegates were busily out, trying to outpoint one another. <laughs> yeah. And when, when the Swami came and said, brothers, mm -hmm. That sort of that just yeah. just wiped that all away mm -hmm. and then that continued. I think that portion Thanks. came yeah. for instance. Yeah. Thank you. Sin, do you Well, it's a bit hard not to mention um, Ramakrishna here. Yes. Who Francis was very, very enamoured of and, and who was um, the commander was his, his protege, and just to say that when Francis, my understanding, of, uh, when Francis first set foot on in India in 54, was it? 54, yep. Um, got off the boat in Calcutta and went straight to the, the Kinshwa temple, um, Ramakrishna's temple in India. It was the first place he went in, in India. Yeah. Whether it was under Baba's direction or his own volition, I don't know. Yeah. But that was immediately off the boat, straight yeah. to Ramakrishna's temple. And, and Baba, Baba told us that Ramakrishna Paramahansa was a perfect master. Mm. Does anyone know if if Francis went there on his own volition or by Baba's direction? No. no. Okay. Um, he was making his way down to the Andhra. Yes, correct. Right. And the next place he visited was um, uh, where um, Chaitanya uh, gained uh, initiation or or mukti or whatever from. Um, his guru, I don't know his name. Right. It might be mentioned his journey with God. I wondered about that, and I had, didn't. I didn't take the time to check. So, that. Tony, did he go to Puri? No. Some other place where this guru uh, initiated um, Chaitanya. Because that was another one of Francis's big favourites was Chaitanya. Right. Right. Um, John, did you want to add anything else? I can't um, think of anything. If just yet, um, what Francis said beyond um, what's in the state of God. Yeah. Um, I, 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 he did, of course, except yeah. uh, think, but if it does occur to me, I'll... I'll yeah. Yeah. Rob Ross mentions both those facts in his book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think Ramakrishna was the first um, Eastern master who, Fran who Francis really heard about, which really was the catalyst. I mean, he, was, he came across Ramakrishna very early. His writings, that's my understanding. Yep. And um, Roman Rollin, isn't that French writer, wrote about him very early on. Um, he was well known in the West quite early. Right. And Francis would have got, had access to those books. And I think um, uh, he was the first. I remember Francis saying that. Yeah. Ramakrishna was yeah. the one who really awakened him to Eastern philosophy, Eastern thought, Eastern spirituality. Yeah. And because Ramakrishna was in Calcutta, I mean, that was a, a big European city. Yes. In those days. Yeah, very much. So I think um, just because of time, I, we, I, I'll skip over Vivekananda, this outline of Vivekananda's life and go just straight to just a couple of Vivekananda quotes just to give you a sense of... Yes, Peter. Well, well, just, well, didn't, wasn't Baba invited to that World Congress late, in later years? I, I, think, I think that's right, yes. 33, yes. Yeah, I think Ward was telling me that. I didn't know it until it day or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What year was this? 1933, but then the whole plan fell through. 
Was it Barbara or Gandhi? Barbara was. Barbara was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. um, Lorraine, would you mind doing the needful? Come out into the broad, open light of day. Come out from the little narrow paths. But how can the infinite soul rest content to live and die in small ruts? Come out into the universe of light. Everything in the universe is yours. Stretch out your arms and embrace it with love. If you ever felt you wanted to do that, you have felt God. Thank you. There, there are, through, when you do a, a, a search of the online um, version of Lord Mayer, the revised online version of, um, the revised online version of Lord Mayer, that's correct, um, there are about ten references to Vivekananda. And interestingly, Baba himself quotes Vivekananda briefly, but, but on, on a number of occasions. Um, Steve, would you mind reading this one, which is from Intoka, 1928. At 8am the next morning, Saturday, 1st of September, 1928, a gathering was held in the new quarters of the Prem Ashram. Baba explained about the four types of Samadhi and then dictated. For God realization, all experienced Mahatmas say, go to a Sadhguru, serve him, love him, and remain in his shelter. Swami Vivekananda in his life of Ramakrishna Paramahansa, my master, expressed his opinion that God must be worshipped as man, that is, as an incarnation of God. And blessed are those races which have such incarnations of God to worship. These incarnations are living gods on earth. These man-gods are real gods who have been worshipped in ages past. Thank, thank you. Um, may, maybe I'll skip over this one, but again, this is, a, this is typical of, of Baba quoting Vivekananda. Um, you see it's there in the middle. Uh, that Baba quoted this couplet from Vivekananda. And... Lorraine, this last one. This Vivekananda <coughs> is rightly expressed. The real teacher is he who comes down to the level of his students. For you fellows, I have come down, I have to come down from my spiritual infinity to the level of this material world, where you are all groping ignorantly in the dark in search of happiness which you cannot and would not ever find without the help of one who has found it and who can lead you to it. Thank you. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Again, Baba mentions Vivekananda. Uh, Darn, that quote on, on, infancy, on infants. Oh, it, it mustn't... Unless I've misplaced it, it's not there. There was a delightful quote that I came across where, ba where Vivekananda said, um, look at the newborn infant. It knows melody and rhythm innately. It doesn't need to be taught. So that was the gist of it. Uh, does anyone know that quote? No. Is that in that, that, that was No, that was Vivekananda. Did I say Vivekananda? Yes. Mm -hmm. I meant to say Vivekananda. Maybe yes. it's in Ayakam. You did say Vivekananda. But it could we, if it appears later, <laughs> I'll rewind that. Sorry. Um, yeah. Five, five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I was thinking that we had to one, but that's okay. Ananda Kumaraswamy has come up a lot today. Um, that's a. He, what his mother was English. His father was. Uh, Selenese, Sri Lankan, and this is a photograph of him. Jeff has given us a great um, overview of the perennial philosophers to whom he um, belonged. Um, this is the quote from, this is the quote, this is, I think the only quote apart from the notes in Stay With God where 
where um, Francis mentions Kumaraswamy. Um, Jeff, do you feel like reading this? With Dante and Co, the rot set in. Love still there, but delusion of self-doing creeping in. Not lover lost in lineaments of beloved. And characterization instead of attributes of God. Begun by Euripides, who came after Aeschylus. After Homer, the pure. The practice of writing is, Mr. Bacon said, to make one an exact man. The Pandava brothers guru, don't shoot until you can see the target. The scholar Kumaraswamy said, to imprison fire against senility. We define it, a burnt offering insistent on present altar. Since Dante and Co, we've been doing it ever since. Seriousness of the immature, craftsmen to each other. Children playing prophets. I saw, I saw, past tense. I feel. Artists as antennae of the race. To be candid, I don't know what to imprison fire against senility means. If we ha Does anyone have a quick take on it? We're all too old to, to <laughs> compute. Thank you, Sam. We're too old to figure that out. Again, I'll just skip over this. Hazrat in Khan, <coughs> a very important person, of course, in our lineage. And this is a quote from Stay This is uh, the main quote from Stay With God. Steve, please. I'm going to read in Ayat Khan, not Ayat Khan. And in Ayat Khan said, in India the idea has always been towards music of a single instrument, suitable for a cave, a grass hut or a temple, and a solo singer. In the West, they're like an orchestra that can be heard through a park. Stay on. One would wonder why a man who wants to show some devotion to God to make sounds well pleasing to him should need a hundred instruments and perhaps an organ and two hundred men and women bawling and screaming at one another. One would suppose that he thought God was a long way off or had brass ears. One wonders why they want to play a piano faster and faster Minute waltz got down to 51.2 seconds and make notes run together to make colours and try to make them tell stories as though there was no more pigments and brushes or language with lovely words to use. Thank you, Steve. It's, it sounds like to me, to the 200 men and women bawling and screaming at, each, at one another, that Francis was not a fan of opera. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that's what it is. This is maybe just the, the one line, so can you find it? And I can't say it. Halfway down. Sri Hamsa, <coughs> yeah. Sri Hamsa said, I am an instrument played on by the divine hand. And I can't say, everywhere I look, I see thy winning face. Francis said, brother son, and he wasn't poetizing. Thank you. Again, okay, just a brief history of. Um, this is it, and I can. This is it, and I can. My mistake. Yes. Lorraine, please. We grown up people think that we appreciate music, but if we realise the sense that an infant has brought with it of appreciating sound and rhythm, we would never boast of knowing music. The infant is music itself. Thank you. Thank you. I'll skip over that quote. Um, it's, I've run out of time. I'll just take another couple of minutes. I just want to mention briefly, I know almost nothing about the Baha'i faith. I know that there were, the three founders were originally the Baha' and then Bahu'ala, or I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, that correctly, and then Abdul Baha. And Abdul Baha was the person who came to America that Elizabeth referred to. Um, Sim and I had the experience of going to the Baha'i Temple, which is quite close to Mayer House in Sydney. And you can't see it from Mayer House, but, but from Beacon Hill, you can see it on the horizon. It's a 
wonderful building, and we will, I think, both impressed, both really taken by the quotes, the Baha'i quotes, the how beautiful they were, and um, and Elizabeth obviously, either directly from Baha or from her own intuition, saw Abdul Baha as being a, a herald to Baha. So just just for your interest, that's a, a photograph, of, I presume, colorized photograph of him in Paris in. 1911, I think, and another one, and that's a brief history of. Um, and there's no reference to Abdul Baha or Baha'i in Stay with God at all. Um, <coughs> but uh, maybe Lorraine, maybe maybe in closing, I could get you to read this quote. Religion should unite all hearts and cause wars and disputes to vanish from the face of the earth. It should give birth to spirituality and bring light and life to every soul. If religion becomes a cause of dislike, hatred and division, it would be better to be without it. Any religion which is not a cause of love and unity is no religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. It's lunchtime, I think.